Hi, everyone. Welcome to Gerontology, Engaging Gerontology Talks with myself, Zoe Byington. Um, I am now a recent graduate of the Georgetown Aging and Health Master's Program, and we have a super special guest today, too. And first, this is my co-host, Sherry Snelling. Hi, everybody. As Zoe said, I'm Sherry Snelling. I'm a corporate gerontologist and CEO of Caregiving Club, and I worked with Zoe on this project as part of her internship project for Georgetown University. Yes, and like a little drum roll, da 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 da. This is the person who kind of facilitated all of this for me. This is the director of the master's program at Georgetown University Aging and Health, Dr. Pamela Saunders. So, welcome. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're the person that, that made this all happen, Dr. Saunders, and brought us together. So, <laughs> well, I, I can't say how excited I am to be part of the conversation and love that uh, I can bring people together like this. Exactly. So we can get just uh, get into this here. So first question, kind of always what we kind of want to figure out is kind of why gerontology for you? How did you start and how did it kind of develop into your full career now? Well, that's a great question. I love to talk about my career narrative to anybody who will listen. Uh, so I actually did my PhD in sociolinguistics here at Georgetown many years ago. And my dissertation examined the life histories, the life histories of older adults living in assisted living. I'd always been interested in narrative and the way people tell stories. I was interested in gender differences, uh, but then I realized I was really interested in studying life stories of older adults, people who are at the end of their lives, and. Um, I was interested in the content, what people talked about, um, how they told their stories, were they long or short, were they organized in a certain way, by chapters or maybe more by scenes. Uh, and then I was also interested uh, in how people with diagnoses of depression told life stories differently. Uh, so I spent a number of years in uh, assisted living research center up in Philadelphia and got to interview lots of very interesting people. And that was really the start of my career in gerontology. From there, I did two postdoctoral fellowships, one at University of California, San Francisco in sociocultural gerontology. That program was based out of the medical anthropology department. And then I did a second postdoctoral fellowship in communication, language, and aging at the University of Kansas. Uh, and I learned more about writing grants and honed a few of my other skills uh, and learned more about aging and different ways to do research. And then back to Georgetown and started my career. I think that's really cool because a lot of people we've talked to in our series are people who start off right away with gerontology degrees, um, kind of like myself. And I think it's cool how you kind of let the ball kind of roll for yourself and you found your interest going there. Um, kind of transitioning to our next question. So then coming back to Georgetown, like what influenced you to create this program that I was very happy to be a part of? Oh, wow, love that, love that question too. So I spent a number of years at Georgetown um, based in the medical school, teaching medical students about communication. And I would you know, occasionally do a little project looking at geriatrics and communication, um, wrote some grants looking at communication uh, with people who suffer from uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, but I didn't get a chance really to teach gerontology fully. Uh, and so there were a couple of factors that influenced the beginning of this, this program. I think my personal passion for studying people as they age was probably the biggest influence. Uh, really being able to get my hooks into teaching classes like theories of gerontology weren't quite available yet. But then uh, probably the top factor was the leadership. Uh, the dean's office in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences wanted a suite of interdisciplinary master's programs. And the Dean who was in charge at that point said aging. Why is there no degree program at Georgetown having to do with aging? There was nothing undergrad, nothing grad. Um, 
so they brought us all together and we developed a curriculum for an interdisciplinary master's program in aging and health. And I think the leadership support from the top made it a pleasure to do. You may talk to other programs, uh, other program leaders, and it isn't always quite so top supportive. Sometimes it's more of a grassroots effort, but we had the support of the dean's office uh, and got to develop the curriculum the way we wanted. We were charged with gathering faculty from across the university. So the business school and the law school and the nursing school and the med school, we got to invite faculty to teach with us. So that made us a program with lots of expertise, lots of faculty, um, really a wonderful way to start a program. And then with all those faculty supported from Georgetown, I think the third factor was we had people inside as well as people outside the university from local organizations and communities and other gerontology programs. They were really excited for us to be another member of the pack. You know, there were not, uh, uh, people were always supportive, willing to help. There wasn't a lot of competition. Um, having more programs focused on aging was a good thing all around. So I'd say those are the, probably the three biggest influences. Well, and, and Dr. Saunders, I think, you know, um, to kind of follow up on Zoe's question, I think that is so important. And I love the fact that you brought together all these kind of multidisciplinary viewpoints on aging and on gerontology. So tell us going forward, and when you think of the context of Georgetown and the wonderful education that you get, why is the gerontology program and the aging and health program, as you call it, why is that really important to the university? And is it something that you see growing in the future? Yeah, it it's really, you know, a couple of things that come to mind. So the mission of Georgetown uh, University, uh, one of the aspects of the mission is cure personalis, which means care for the whole person. Uh, and another really important pillar of Georgetown is the idea of social justice for underserved populations. So this program, Understanding Aging and Older Adults, really fit perfectly into the mission of Georgetown understanding people who are older, who can be vulnerable in many ways, uh, and then caring for that whole person, really a wraparound from the psychology to the family life, to health, to well-being, to finances and policy was really, you know, the whole person. Uh, so I think the mission of Georgetown and the mission of our program were, were very closely aligned. Um, then also, George, we are the only degree program in the District of Columbia that has a program in aging. So we thought, hey, there's an opportunity here. Uh, we want to teach people about aging and gerontology. And here, this is a Georgetown University is a great place to do that in the District of Columbia. And then Georgetown is doing a ton of research in aging. And I don't think that people always knew about one another. Uh, and you know, we have uh, researchers from the bench to clinical researchers to policy researchers here at Georgetown you know, looking at issues of aging and HIV and looking at mechanisms for uh, cells, cell senescence. Uh, we have faculty looking at health disparities and socio-demographic trends in the District of Columbia for older adults. We have faculty looking at cancer treatments and cognitive aging. So I think the opportunity for Georgetown to coalesce uh, and and really focus on all of those strengths uh, was really another boon uh, for the university to have a program like this. 
Well, and I know that um, I recently attended um, a great conference that you put on where you brought a lot of these experts and researchers together to kind of share, you know, what's happening now, but also what's what's being looked at in the future. And I think, as you said, you're you're kind of in, in the hub of a few things, the medical uh, community for sure, but also policymaking in Washington, D.C. And one mm -hmm. of the things I've really enjoyed and, and I'm really honored that you invited me to be part of your large advisory group that you have for this program was you also really embrace a lot of the arts and the cultural, you know, aspects of aging and, and whether it's music or theater or as you mentioned with your career, life storytelling and all of that, what are some of the highlights that maybe you can share with us of the program or certain projects or things that, that you have had the students focus on? Well, thanks, Sherry. You know, I appreciate your bringing up the symposium that we had in July. It was uh, launched from the new Center for Healthy Aging at Georgetown, which is just getting on its feet. And you know, having the Dean of Research be there to lead us off in that conference and then having faculty from, from all departments across the university, I think was an opportunity that we hadn't had before. And the Aging and Health Program, you know, is a member of the center and we got to support that synergy. You know, I, I don't know that everybody knows what people are doing on main campus and the, the cross campus Communication, you know, we we sometimes get in our stuck in our little ivory, ivory towers. Uh, so having something like the symposium, you know, with the aging program involved, I think is uh, was really a, a great moment for us, and we hope to do that going forward. Um, highlights from the master's program, you know, one of the things I've loved from the very beginning is that we are an intergenerational program. So we have students with amazing backgrounds in diversity, age diversity. We have students from the 20 year olds to the 70 year olds and the robust classroom conversations that come from having people from that diverse age range, all of us with different life experience, with different job experience, with different knowledge base, uh, I, I found myself advising students and the younger students would come to me and say, am I going to fit in or am I going to be embarrassed because I don't know enough about life and work? And I had the older students come to me and say, I don't know, am I going to fit in because all these younger students, they know all this new technology that I don't know. And I'm going to, I'm worried I'm going to feel dumb. And then the classroom, as Zoe can probably attest, is just a wonderful sharing community and really embodying that intergenerational feeling that we want to live every day. Well, I think that's been one of my, the highlights for me. And I think it's great because it underscores too what we know about gerontology. Zoe and I have been talking about how when you tell people, oh, yes, I have a master's in gerontology, they automatically think, well, you're only um, studying older people. You're only studying people maybe towards end of life. And as we know, it's really across the life course, how we age, the choices that we make in life and, and other things. So I think the intergenerational component that you have is really exciting because it really that's what gerontology is all about, right? That's right. And, you know, not everybody, every university community is quite ready for having all those ages in the classroom. And it's just because it hasn't happened before. So I love being able to push those boundaries. Um, and I think, you know, the diversity continues. We have students from business, psychology, political science, philosophy, foreign languages, in addition to gerontology who are all bringing knowledge uh, and learning, learning together. Uh, so it's, you know, that's another part of the diversity. Uh, and I think probably the third highlight is that, and this kind of taps into what I said about the symposium, I think the master's program has been a focal point. So people can really point to something at the university and say, this is where they're doing aging or, this is, this is where aging lives at Georgetown. And it's started to bring pieces together. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
you know, that's been a goal of mine from the very beginning is to be able to have a home and to grow gerontology across the university. I also run the geriatrics clerkship for third year medical students. And, you know, I've been doing that work for a long time, kind of over there on the the other side of campus. And now being able to connect main campus with med center campus and be able to teach people, this is what we're doing. This is all the things we're studying. uh, I think has been, you know, a personal highlight, but also uh, something really special to the university. Great. Uh, Yes. (laughs) I was going to say all those highlights, there are reasons why I chose the program myself. I think overall the biggest I think takeaway was being classrooms with that multi-generational learning and especially um, in our psychology of aging class where um, Professor Sonia Barsness really uh, infiltrated that by having older adults as our learning partners. And and just a really cool takeaway because all these other programs I looked at in undergraduate, they don't have that. And this is something that is super unique. And again, the reason why I decided to come to Georgetown. Yay. And I wanted to pick up on something that Sherry said earlier about arts and humanities. So we have a class in um, humanities and ethics of aging. And, you know, when I designed the class, I lumped these two fields into one class and the, the, the synergy and the, and the overlap and the connections were clear to me, but when I look around, I don't see a lot of classes that lump humanities and ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've had uh, a faculty member, Dr. Gay Hanna, who's uh, an artist and a gerontologist, uh, take over this class and do some amazing things with it. Looking at ethical issues that are obviously important as humanists, but also looking at arts and creativity that help us to be humans mm-hmm. and support our well-being and being able to make those bridges between ethics and humanities has been super exciting. And she has a exercise in her class and Zoe can probably tell you about it in more detail where each student has to create an avatar. They pick where you get assigned a a basic profile, but then you have to sketch out your avatar, flesh them out in terms of age and gender and ethnicity and uh, and then life experiences. So if your avatar is a 60 year old woman living in DC, what has her life been like and what are the kinds of things she's going to experience? Zoe, can you tell us about your avatar? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, going to that kind of bring that humanistic approach to it. And again, highlighting within the program is as someone who is not in that stage of life, a project like this allowed myself to be put in someone else's shoes and kind of put myself as someone who's, let's say, a 60 year old woman who's lived in DC all their life and any of the social determinants of health that's impacted them. And one thing that I believe while doing these arts and humanities, it really gives you that personal touch. Research, we can see that, but in a different way. But the humanistic side, we're really able to understand. Mm. And it goes to the whole complexity of this program in general, pulling so many different um, disciplinaries all together. Right. And I'm seeing the application of it. I do a lot of my work in the employer channel where I'm working with a lot of employers on workplace issues around family caregiving and, and, you know, certain aging and um, different age groups in the workplace. And I'm just thinking about that particular project. What a great project to have, for instance, managers go through and the HR department go through to really start to think about, right? What are the differences that are needed with the different ages in the workplace? So I, that's fascinating. I love I love that idea because I think it's very accessible. Mm-hmm. You don't need to be a scholar to put yourself in someone else's shoes and start thinking, how do I create uh, an idea, a persona, somebody who goes through life experiences. Uh, and uh, that's very cool. I like that. I, uh, I'll have to connect you with Dr. Hannah to explore that. <laughs> Absolutely. More. I'd love to talk to her about that. That's He's great. a great person to talk to. Um, <laughs> and kind of going to our last question, as we know, we're going to have 
just a plethora amount of older adults um, as the future continues. So how important do you think it is, Dr. Saunders, to have gerontologists and growth through degree programs um, like Georgetown? So I don't know what is the big, big enough word. How, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, extremely important. I, um, as you all know, our world is getting older. Um, we all have a relative who is facing joys and challenges of aging. We, all three of us are aging. Uh, and you know, we want to support people as they age. It's a family issue. It's a societal issue. It's a cultural issue. It's, it taps into all of those, those factors, uh, health and wellness and, and policymakers. And we need to train all kinds of professionals. So like uh, Sherry's experience with caregivers um, and people were actually working in the field of senior living or people writing policy at uh, Medicare and Medicaid. I want everybody even from the product designers who are creating the new iPhone or are like Sherry's work with some of the big companies designing products. I want everybody to know some concepts about aging, some theories, some practices, so we can support each other as we get older as a society together. I think that's a really nice way to put it. And I can say personally, as I said, I just graduated from the program and going to my job search, um, I am seeing how this degree can be used in so many different areas. It doesn't just have to be in aging itself. Like you said, I can look at a totally different field and it be used there. So I, that's about all the questions I have. Sherry, anything else from you? No, I just think, I think we wrapped up beautifully because as you said, Dr. Saunders, we're all aging, right? It's the one commonality that we all have. And I think, you know, we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our older loved ones and also our younger generations to really think about, you know, what, what does this look like after 50 or after 60? Cause we know we're going to have those 20 to 30 bonus years of life that we still want to thrive and enjoy. And, uh, and so I think this is a great, this has been a great conversation, Dr. Saunders. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Pleasure. Saunders. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you both. Yes. And that anyone that's interested in pursuing a degree in aging and health, I highly recommend checking out Georgetown university, um, <laughs> master's program in aging and health. So thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. And this is engaging in gerontology talks.